Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Yang. I'm a graduate student in Michigan. And it's a great honor for me to present our paper here. The topic is Cloud Davis Transfer Bridge Forecasting Cybersecurity Instance. This is John work with my colleagues Armin, Jean Perinus from Michigan, uh, Manish from CoreMetrics, Michael from UIUC, and my advisor Minya from Michigan. So uh, we were motivated by observing increasingly frequent and high impact data breaches. It is not so hard to name a few high profile incidents in the year 2014 alone. You can see big names here, Target, JP Morgan, Home Depot, to just name a few. And each of the incidents incurs massive private information stolen and leakage, such as employee information, customer credit card information, et cetera. And all these numbers and all these, if you remember, this medium coverage give us very direct evidence that there's increasing model social and economic impact that are coming out from such instance. So, however, the current solutions approaches against such breach are mostly detection-based. And detection-based method fail to detect or many times it's too late by the time a breach is detected. Therefore, they are not suitable for cost or damage control. And we do see there's urgent need for more proactive measures. So to put our discussion on the difference between det detection and proactive measures, in particular prediction in context, so detection analogies, it, it can be is analogous to diagnosing a patient who may already be ill. Many of the existing works fall into this category, for example, the spam detection, fraud detection, uh, malicious account detection, etc. But prediction is on predicting whether a presently healthy person may become ill or not, based on a variety of relevant factors. And there are relatively less works on this category. But notably, last year at USNIC, the best student paper went to Soska and Christian for their great work on predicting whether a web page may turn malicious or not on the near future. And uh, this is the type of work this paper is interested in. And also, we are really glad to say this year at USNIC, we, we are we're going to see even more papers on this topic, especially within this session. I very, very much look forward to seeing them. Uh, back to the topic, our goal is to understand to what extent we can forecast instance on an organizational level. And to achieve this goal, our objective is to develop the ability to forecast security instance with the following properties. The first property is applicability. So we want to rely solely on externally observable data so, now, so that we do not require any information on the internal working of the network or its host or the organization or the company. So that, that is, we are not begging for information from organization to organization. The second one is robustness. So we are we're going to use measurement data to carry all this analysis, but we do not have any control over or direct knowledge of the data we collected. So we want a robust method that against any local noise. So the key idea is to tap into a diverse set of data that capture different aspects of network security posture, ranging from explicit to latent. Uh, why prediction, after all? And if we ever succeed, what are the benefits we could, we, we could bring to the community? So forecast or prediction enables entirely new classes of applications, which are otherwise not feasible. For instance, prediction allows proactive policy or measures to be adopted rather than reactive measures. And uh, forecast enables effective risk management schemes. For instance, as in internal to an organization, we can offer more informed decision on resource allocation. How should you allocate your resource on different security issues? And as external to an organization, we can develop incentive mechanism, such as several insurance to offer. So with all this, here's the outline of the talk. I'm first going to introduce the data and some preliminaries. And then I'll talk about the forecasting method. And the last part will be forecasting result as well as some analysis over certain observations we saw that might be, use, might be useful and interesting. Before I get into the details, we can take a quick glance of the data that we have. This study rely mainly on three categories of data. So first is mismeasurement symptoms. Second is malicious activity data. These two set of data are used to extract features to describe network's posture. And we also refer to this data as security posture data. The third one is incident report. They are public reports summarizing the incident that happened in the last two years. So we use this data to train and test our classifier to serve as labels. Right? So first of oh first, security posture data. The first set of security posture data is this mismanagement symposium. 
they are deviations from known best practice on IP address level. And in this part of study, it focused five of them, namely misconfigured HTTPS certification, a misconfigured DNS, including open recursive resolver and source port randomization, mail servers, and BGP. But notice that none of these features ties directly to this vulnerability of this bridge. But they are indicators of lack of policy or expertise. For, for instance, if the organization cannot even configure their web page correctly, we believe there's a higher chance for them to be breached into. And these data are collected around the middle of 2013. The reason is we want them to be prior to any instance we collected. So that is, we are using the past data to predict for the future. The second data is malicious activity data. These are a set of 11 reputation blacklists. They are daily collections of IP addresses engaged in some malicious activities. And in this study, we, in this study we have three malicious activity type, namely spamming, phishing, and scan. And we have a time series collection. We use data between May 2013 up to December 2014. Notice this data is much more dynamic compared to the previous data, which I'm gonna show later. So we're gonna utilize this di dynamics of this data. And also notice, uh, even though we have full period time of data collection, for each incident, for each prediction, we are, we are only gonna use the data that is before the occurrence of this instance to do prediction. So instant data, we, have, we rely on three public sources. All these three data sets are publicly available, uh, namely HackMagdan, Web Hacking Instant Data, and VCDB data. But uh, they are a very different format, and they are even reporting very different things. You could say the instant types reported are a very different format and different categories, like SQL injection, including SQL injection, hijacking, defacement, etc. cetera. Uh, so as you may already notice, we have diverse collection data, and these data are in very different format. So this, even though we are desire, desiring for this diversity in the data, still this diversity gives us some troubles. First of all, we're gonna clean the incidents because they are reporting in very different format. So whole our group spent quite a bit of efforts on reading this report, extracting key terms from the report, and put them into a uniform case so we can do automatic analysis. And second, we want to remove in relevant cases for example, we found in the database there are some reporting saying there are robbery at a liquor store. So, and some other cases saying something happened, but we don't know what happened. So these cases are definitely irrelevant to our study. So we need to kick up, make sure these are out of the study. Uh, secondly, this diversity presents challenging aligning them in time and space. For instance, this posture record records information at IP address level. Well, as you can imagine, this incident report associated with organization without pointing out to a specific machine or IP address. And to align this data, sorry, to align this data is not trivial, since uh, this IP address reallocation makes this boundary between organization unclear. So the way we solve this problem, we propose a manual mapping process. We first summarize owner ID from this five RIR, the original internet registration database, and by summarizing this data, we found 4.4 million prefixes listed under 2.6 million owner ID. So that is, in our study, we found three million, roughly three million organizations that we can carry analysis over. Uh, notice this is a finer degree compared to a routing table, right? And then we sample IP address from each organization. This can be done using online query or manual search. And we search this IP address in this big table we built to find a block IP address that is sharing the same owner ID. Okay, so in this way, we are mapping the organization to a block of IP addresses. And then we can associate the data or the features that we extract from data to the organization through these IP blocks. So the forecasting method. Quick look at the approach. We first extract features. In the study, we extract more than 250 features from the data set, and we summarize them as primary features and secondary features. So then we generate labels for this instant data set, and we train a classifier using random forest, which is in centralized extension to classical decision tree method. This looks pretty standard, but most of our efforts are on feature extraction and label generation and cleaning. So first, feature extraction. So primary features. So primary feature is essentially the raw data, the statistics that we can calculate directly from this raw data we collected. The first set is the five mismeasurement simple terms. So for the five simple term, we have five features correspondingly. Each feature measures a fraction. That is a fraction of semantic IP within your organization. 
For instance, for this untrusted HTTP certification, this feature is mirroring the fraction of web servers that has untrusted certification out of this total number of web servers respond to our scan. And similarly, we define the feature for all the, all the other simple terms. We can do a quick CDF profiling of these features to say whether they are indicative or not. And I'll give you two examples here. So you could see this is CDF, and this is, uh, this is a fraction of the features. Uh, the right curve is the victim organization. You can see the victim organization tend to have a much larger fraction of untrusted certification compared to non-victim organization. And these features can very well tell one group from another. The second set of features is malicious activity time series data features. So this time series data, for each organization, we have three time series data corresponding to the three types, spam, phishing, and scan. And for each data, we take two months period of time for feature extraction. So this is two, two months period of time, all these six days is a, is a trade-off between accuracy and computation complexity. And we found, I mean, empirically, six days give us fairly good performance. Uh, but later we are showing a second feature, we're also gonna add a recent two weeks data because six days is kind of like long period of time give you a more static description of the network. But recent, recent data can give you a more relevant evidence of its recent trending. So I give you three examples. You could say these are uh, so several examples of this time series data. They have very different dynamics and very different dynamic patterns. So we, we conjecture this difference can be telling in terms of separating these two groups. And the last parameter feature is the size. It's the number of IP address in your organization. So this number, to some extent, captures the likelihood of an organization becoming the target of or reporting intentional attacks. So as we look through the database, we found medium size to larger size companies tend to suffer more from data breaches. And by this, I conclude this primary feature. I'm going to proceed to secondary feature. Secondary feature was motivated by, exactly by capturing these shapes, the difference in the shapes in the time series data. Our motivation is all this rise or drop of the time series data made due to the responsiveness of this IP team, IT, IT team, the security team of this organization. So we want to capture such behavior what we call latent behavior. So the way we have a model, and to, to simplify it, it's just a quantization-based model. For example, for this time series data, this is a number of malicious IP address. It first calculates the average, which is the red line, and then we specify two thresholds. So everything above the upper threshold compared to the, magnet, compared to the average, we call it bare region. All right, so that is, this number of malicious IP address is higher than some threshold. Otherwise here, we call it good region. Everything in the middle, we call it a normal case. So by this quantization, we can start how long does this time series stay in each region. So this measures security effort and responsiveness, right? For example, this part measures persistency. How long does it take when you hit the bad region for you to come back, right? And in each of these regions, we can measure the average magnitude, average duration, average frequency. Frequency is essentially how often do you hit each region. Again, a quick profiling, you could say, uh, this, these features to different degrees can separate these two groups two, two group from one from another. And I'm not gonna go through all the details, but you could see this bottom left part, this is a CDF profiling for bad duration. And you could say victimization has a much longer duration in the bad region, which might indicate a much slower response time for this organization, all right? So after we got these features, we're gonna train a classifier. So in order to train classifier, we need two groups. First is victim group. Um, in order to decide the victim, this victim group is taken from this incident report, and we separate, we separate or split the incident report into training and testing. The split is according, the split is according to a training test ratio. For example, 78% to serve as training, 30 for testing, or 50-50. But notice, like, we, throughout the study, we mostly use 50-50, but this is not an aggressive number. Most cases, people use nine-fold or ten-fold. That's a much higher training rate. And also notice the key difference here. We strictly split this data according to time step. So we are only using the past data to predict for the future. In machine learning, many times this split, this shuffling, is random generated. So we, this is deterministic split. Also, we need to uh, we need to find a random we need to find a subset of non-victim organization to pair up with these victim organizations. The way we do this, we random subsample this big table, as I mentioned earlier, to find a group that is with comparable size. Why we do that? Because we only have a few hundred to thousand victim group, but we have three million clean organizations. So adding them together will not give you a meaningful result. 
So random subsampling a comparable size of group to avoid imbalance as a classical issue in machine learning. But we're going to repeat this process multiple times to generate different variants of classifier to smooth out the noise of each trial. Okay, so the result. The first, we do prediction. Prediction is fairly simple. It works as follows. So there's a timeline. The red stars are instants. So first, for each instant, we're going to extract the features up to the months before the incident happened, all right? And for next one, we move this window to extract features right, right in front of it and we'll keep doing this. What we call this short-term predi prediction. So we are only predicting whether for next month there's going to be an incident or not. And after each month, we're going to update this feature extraction. So here's the main result. We have this ROC curve. So in the format of true positive and false positive. So notice this is a true positive rate and false positive rate. So we normalize, between, normalize them to 0 to 1. There are four curves here corresponding to our experiment over three incident data set, as well as a combination of them. So a combination serves as a cross-validation in some sense. Uh, but uh, in general, we have wild range of operating point. So on each curve, different point corresponding to different threshold. Remember, the classifier gives you a probability indicating the, chance, the risk chance for each organization. We can further specify a threshold to generate a label for it. So different nodes corresponding to different threshold. And each node, as I mentioned earlier, is average over multiple trials with this random sampling. And in general, we can say uh, we have a well range of operating point, and we can, for all these four cases, we can achieve 90% of true positive with 10% of false positive. In, uh, in particular, when we combine all data, we achieve 88% true positive and 4% of uh, false positive. So remember, like 4% or even 10% false positive in prediction is not as bad as detection. So we are not blocking or we are not deleting anything. We are simply sending out an alarm or warning with this mistake rate. Right? And also we test the split ratio effect. So you can see the green curve is with slightly higher training data. You're definitely going to see a better performance, as you may expect. And also we got asked this question, what if we do long-term predictions? That is, we do not update the feature extraction every time for each instant. Instead of fix this extraction tape, uh, window, we're only going to generate prediction for the next few months or next year. So if, what, what do we do for this long prediction? Again, we test this case. We can say, even though long-term prediction has a slightly worse performance, it's comparable. And this, the difference in the performance we conjecture is due to the temporal features we extracted got outdated, right? So we are not updating the temporal features at a monthly basis. So we got a slightly worse performance. And also, as a byproduct of this machine learning process, we have importance of the features and output, output it along with these labels. So these features are essentially scalars ranging from 0 to 1. The higher the number is, the better, uh, the more important the feature is. So these are the top four features. You could say two mismeasurement features rank in the top four. And the highest one is uh, untrusted certification. This makes sense to us as we look at the data set. Many data breaches are actually uh, related to, uh, to their web servers as an entry point. So the certification definitely is a, a powerful indicator. We can do other, uh, many other observations. For example, we can summarize the importance for each feature, each category of data, and we can rank them. We found mismanagement data so far is the most powerful descriptor. And more interestingly, we, can, we found secondary features are almost as important as time series data. This sounds a little bit counterintuitive, since the secondary features were extracted from time series data. From information series perspective, you are not adding any information, right? But why is this still so significant? So the reason is the classifier cannot read the data in the optimal way as you expect. So we need to manipulate the data manually and push them into classifier. And also we summarize the dynamic features, the duration and frequency. We found they are much more important compared to static features. This is very inspiring since uh, we found many studies in this area is, is to calculate or capture the static behavior of this data. But this is saying we should pay more attention to these dynamic features that may be more telling in terms of, the, in terms of different objectives. Uh, after all, when we separate different sets of data, we are not achieving comparable results. So this is saying we cannot rely on a single individual data source to do prediction. We need to combine all of them to utilize this diversity. All right, so key started. Back to the original question, can we really forecast security? So this is a simple realization of this one point on the performance curve. So this is a CDF profiling for one particular classifier output of this performance curve. 
And this blue curve is the profiling the number for non-victim organization, and red curve is for victim organization. All right, so you can easily see there's a huge difference between these two curves. It's not so surprising following our observation on the success of the classifier, since we can, with high probability, we can tell one group from another. So you can imagine this curve should be very well separated from each other. More interestingly, we can uh, do case studies, for example, on organizations on different regions of the curve to say what makes this organization sit in different area, like true positive, true negative, false negative, et cetera. And uh, we also uh, write down the high profile day breaches on the right curve. You could say we can safely capture Sony, eBay, Home Depot, Target. And they are with fairly high numbers. And more interestingly, we found online tax name with the number being 0.92. So you may know online tax was a vendor, vendor for a JP Morgan who was really paying responsibility for the data breach. Uh, okay, so I think I'm gonna conclude my talk with several discussions. First is the error in the data. So throughout the process, there are multiple errors in each part of the data. But our claim is the ultimate verification comes from the prediction accuracy. As long as, as, long as this data gives us decent performance, uh, this individual error does not matter too much. Second is uh, we test our method against adversarial data by observing the popularity of adversarial machine learning. Uh, the reason is if we can learn the behavior of hackers, why not them cannot learn us? So they can inject malicious data towards our learning strategy. So we test our method against, that, against such cases. We found it's pretty robust. It's mainly due to, firstly, the random subsampling and the random trials of training classifier. Second is we have a diverse set of features. So unless you have a large amount of resource to attack each individual dimension of this classifier, you're not gonna change the whole big picture of this prediction. Uh, thirdly, uh, so far we only talked about prediction on uh, whether there is going to be an incident or not, but we haven't talked too much about what type of incident this could be. This is mainly due to we don't have enough samples to train a classifier for individual types of incident, but we do, in our database, we do find one particular incident type, that is web application, web application. We found more than 300 samples. So we train a dedicated classifier for web application, and we show similar result. This is reported in our paper, so you, you may take a look. But uh, we also found two recent papers on um, trying to solve this problem with more careful considerations. One is from Symantec. They are using uh, sector information, business information, and organization information to try to predict some targeted attack for each organization. And one of our group's recent paper, which appeared a couple months ago at WISE, is talking about how do you use additional, additional data, such as business sector information data, to generate conditional probability distribution over different incident types. This is a conditional prediction, conditional on an incident is happening. So the experiments are done over the victim, victim data. So sort of like extension of this paper, so you may want to check, check it out. And ultimately, we, we want to make discussions. The quality of this study ties closely to the quality of data, and instant data remain grossly underreported. And uh, even within the reported data, there are so many bias. Uh, so we, as we already show in the paper, we are already benefiting quite a bit by, with, with this limited reporting, so why not everybody report more? And uh, we share our data in a more uniform case at this web page, so you can take a look. Uh, to use for your own research or other verification purpose. Uh, with this, I conclude my talk. I, we thank NSF and DHS for their funding, and we thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd like to take any questions either here or offline. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> Rachel Green said Drexel. Uh, this is Thank really you. interesting work. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if you've, you know, all of the work that you've done is, is on, on data for which has happened in the past and you have ground truth. So do you have any predictions? What is the <laughs> forecast for the next year and can we see next year at Unix uh, Security what, how right. well this system works? So, uh, yeah, we generate some reports. So if you can, you can, you can definitely visit our webpage or send me an email. I can give you some profiles for, for the future. But uh, in this study, it really appears as we were in 2013. So, right, so whatever we know is in 2013. So we, we were acting as we were in 2013. We are predicting for 2014. It's similar to we are now at 2015 and we are predicting for 2016. But definitely, we are keep generating profiles for, for next year. 
so it, you may come back to me to verify that. Yeah. Is that on the same page as the data? Oh, we have contact information. You may not get the direct knowledge on the profiles, but you can definitely send me. Because there are a huge amount of them, we cannot publish directly on, on the web page. Thank you. Great work. Uh, Tudor Dimitras from the University of Maryland. Thank you. So you profile these organizations, OK? And you say with some amount of certainty that they are likely going to be breached in the future. Right. So is there, you know, based on your profiles, is, are there recommendations that you can issue for yeah. those organizations to, to prevent these breaches? Yes, we definitely can generate uh, recommendation, especially the reason we are doing this is to find which feature matters more towards its prediction. And that we, uh, we, if we find a recommendation we would like to make to the organization, we can further look at their feature set to say which feature of their profile stands out in, in this prediction process. Because all this pr uh, prediction is about combining to the feature importance in a different ways, right, to generate a number, number for you. OK, so you definitely. Can, I guess my question is, you, you can see which feature stands out, but can you verify for, that this is the way they were hacked, right? Even yeah. if, they, if they fixed their certificates, like, right. will that prevent the hack? Yes, so for example, uh, we observe some cases, we contact this organization, some university saying, you are under high risk. They reply to us saying, why? Because we look at their database, we found you have, you have relatively higher fraction of untrusted certification, so please fix them. Or you have a relatively higher number of open recursive resolver, please try to fix them. So we can offer such recommendation because we can look at the specific number or realization of their features. Uh, am I answering your question? I mean, we can talk a little later. Kind of to follow up on that, Richard Johnson, NCAR. <laughs> um, when you're talking about using management, mismanagement indicators mm -hmm. to, as, as a proxy for a general organizational failure that puts them at risk, mm -hmm. um, why do you bother telling them that they have misconfigured HTTPS servers when it would be better if they fixed their general management problem that has that as one of the symptoms? Uh. I, I think they are not, definitely they are not direct causal factors in terms of leading to any particular breach. Uh, they could be very, look, they could look at, look, just look at the features, it could be very much irrelevant. But uh, I think this, to some extent to indicate, as I mentioned, the levels of their management or their policies. So as external factors that may be relevant in some sense, correlated in some sense. Not, so they are correlation factors, not causal factors. Yeah. In some way. 